2 Kings 24 and 25. Today, I called this message, these last two chapters, Don't Become a Slave of Man. I think that's the emphasis here. It's kind of a summary of the whole book of 2 Kings. That it talks about, or just you see the consequences of disobedience to God. There's some of this in the New Testament too. If you think about it, a number of the New Testament letters that were written were urging the church to not become slaves of man so that we would go back to being under captivity of the things that God set us free from. As a matter of fact, Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians 10 that part of the reason why the Old Testament scriptures were written down were for our instruction. He's talking to the church. And it's so that we wouldn't become like most of the Jewish people were back in the era that we're reading about because they were disobedient to God. And so all the things that we're reading about is the result of their disobedience. Look at what Paul said to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians seven twenty three. He says, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Now, I think it's important that we just kind of look at that for a moment because there's a real danger of this happening or he wouldn't have said it to the church. So this does happen to people. And so he wants us to remember good thing we did communion this morning because we remember that we were bought at a price and i'm supposed to always remember that and put myself close to the lord so that i won't become a slave of the world or of man i was uh, remembering when one of my uncles was still alive actually had a chance to share the gospel with him a couple times and i was kind of a newer christian But he was very opposed to God. He was the one of my dad's three brothers that were very opposed to God. And one time I was talking to him about Jesus and just my excitement and my relationship with him. And that the freedom that Jesus gives us from the bondage that all the world is under. Because that's what the Bible teaches us. That the world lies under the sway of the devil, right? And that the world is under that bondage. And he raised his voice at me and said... What are you talking about? You don't know anything, kid. I'm free. Nobody tells me what to do. And those. And I'm try, not trying to be res- disrespectful to him, just telling you what happened. But if you knew him, he was incredibly bound up in pride and the effects of sin in his life. He just didn't see that. You know, he was like ignorant to it. And it's not just him. Most people in this valley are under the same delusion. But you see, God is so good that he wants to set them free from the captivity to their sin. And in addition to that, in this audience that I'm talking to here and online, that he doesn't want Christians to put themselves back under what he set them free from. And that's why Paul said what he said there in 1 Corinthians 7. And so to me, that's the focus here, and that's why I'm spending a little bit of time on it here in the introduction, that main idea is prevalent here in these two chapters. So I'm not going to read all of the text to you. I trust that you can all read because of our time constraints, and I want to finish Second Kings today. So I'm going to cover both these chapters, but I'm going to kind of focus on some areas here and then let you fill in the gaps. And we're just going to look at see how God urges all people everywhere to not become slaves of men. So chapter 24, it's kind of a subtitle. I wrote that if you do, you're going to be sorry. So number one that we're looking at, if you do become a slave of the world, of a man, you're going to be sorry. And we're going to see what happened to them and then apply it to us. So I'm going to start reading here. Verse one, it says, in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, and bands of the people of Ammon. You realize those aren't like worship bands, right? (laughs) He sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. Surely at the commandment of the Lord, this came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh. We'll come back to him in a minute. 
according to all that he had done, and also because of the innocent blood that he had shed, for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. You know, just to back up a little bit, for most of Second Kings, the Assyrians have been the world power. They took over, and there was a divided kingdom of Israel at that time. They conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. We call it Samaria is another way to describe it. They conquered that previously, years ago before this. But now, the Babylonians, and sometimes they're referred to as the Chaldeans, they are rising to power. And of course, just like we see today, they want to control Israel. Somebody always wants to control Israel. And so now it's them. Now, the thing about them is God is letting them do it. That's what we just looked at here. And it's because of Israel's rebellion against them. And so this king, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, is taking over the southern kingdom of Israel, referred to it as Judah, where Jerusalem was. And by the way, this event, the Babylonian captivity, is so significant in the history of Israel that it's written about throughout the Old Testament. If you've read through the Old Testament, you know what I'm talking about because this event is seen in places like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Lamentations and 2 Chronicles and Daniel and Ezra and Psalms. It just goes on and on. Most of the Old Testament comes back to this at some point. Now you wonder why. Why is it so significant? Well, God had removed Israel from subjection to Egypt and gave them the promised land to be a free people to live and worship God. But these chosen people began to worship and serve false gods, false idols, so much so that God had no choice but to chasten or punish them in this way. And so for 70 years now, they're going to be exiles in Babylon, away from their inherited promised land. It's really sad for them. And it's not only recorded in the Bible again and again and again as a significant thing. It's also recorded in secular history. I want to show you a picture here because archaeologists found these Babylonian tablets when they were doing digs around that area. And obviously you can't read this, but in that language, it records all these same events that are going on that we see here of Nebuchadnezzar and and taking the Israelites captive. And it even tells us the date so we can match it to what we see in the scriptures. It's so cool when archaeology, you know, just affirms what we already believe to be true from the scriptures describing all of these things that happen. Some things God won't stop from happening. And this is one of them in chapter 17 of Ezekiel that that this happened because he wanted Israel to be brought low and not lifted up. Like that they were going through this in order that they would learn to humble themselves because they were very prideful in who they were. And then in chapter 25 of Ezekiel, he said that they were doing all of this to their own hurt. So you can get a sense of what's going on with this. They're doing it to themselves, and God is trying to to humble them. There's even a scene in Jeremiah 36 where this king that's being talked about in these first few verses, Jehoiakim, he is being read the scroll of Jeremiah in his palace while he's sitting beside a fire. This scribe is reading him the scroll of Jeremiah. And as the king... Jehoiakim hears it, he takes it and cuts out a few columns and throws it in the fire. And then the scribe keeps reading, and then he takes another section and cuts it out and throws it in the fire. And you and I, who love the word, are like, what is he doing? Even though it's shocking to us, how many today pick and choose the parts that they want to observe and then try and toss the rest of it? Or... I don't want to hear it, so I'm not going to go where they preach it, or I'm going to just keep my Bible closed so I don't have to be confronted with it all the time. You know, those kind of things. And and here he is doing these things as if that gets rid of God's holy word and the truth that it is. It doesn't. That's kind of the approach with some. You know, one last thing here. Uh, Verse 3 
talks about Manasseh. I said I was going to come back to him. Uh, King Manasseh is mentioned here. And what's, it's really kind of interesting that it does because he's been gone for 50 years. But his impact is still being felt. The effect of his sin has not gone away. He's like that old saying, like it's like a pebble that's been thrown into a pond and then the ripples just keep going out and out and out. That's like what he did. Even though when we went through his life previously in Second Kings, it looks like he repented at the end of his life and got right with the Lord. It's it pretty obvious that he did, actually. And yet, all those years of rebellion, I mean, he was an awful king, did terrible things, and got Israel to do it. And so it's left all these scars forever, and they're paying the price for it. And so that's what the author here is letting us know in those first few verses. Okay, so what happens next is Jehoiakim, that king, he dies, and then Jehoiachin becomes the king, who's also a bad guy. Let's pick up the story here in verse 10. It says, At that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city as his servants were besieging it. Then Jehoiachin, king of Judah, his mother, his servants, his princes, and his officers went out to the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon, in the eighth year of his reign, took him prisoner. And he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. And he cut in pieces all the articles of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. Also, he carried into captivity all Jerusalem, all the captains, all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. Remember, you guys, the reason why this is happening is that the Hebrew people, they wanted to live like all the idol worshipers, and now they're being forced to go live with them. And it's really tragic that that's happening. Now, Jesus warned us about these things, to not be like them. He taught us, if you recall, to be in the world, but not of the world. Like, we're here, we live here in this place, this fallen world where it's full of sinners. And sin's going on all around us. But we're just urged to not be conformed to it, that we would be different. And the reason is because if you do be conformed to it, you become a slave to it. And that's what Israel is doing. And so this is simply the result of them longing after the gods of this world. They had an affection for the cares of the world, and it led to their ruin. But you know, Jesus is so awesome because his desire is to change your affections, that you wouldn't have affections for the world anymore, that you would prefer him above all things. They don't, and so they just basically surrender to the enemy. I was trying to think of like an, an illustration or example that we could use today. And so this is the best one that I could come up with. Imagine a guy who grew up, say, in a Christian home. As he became a young adult, he got into drugs. Initially, it's sort of an experimental thing for him. That wasn't allowed in his upbringing. So he's like, I'm going to try a few things. He kept telling me not to do this. I want to see what it's like, right? And initially, he tried a few things. Maybe it was some friends influencing him, peer pressure. And then maybe he gets a little enjoyment initially out of the high or whatever. But it begins to get worse and worse. Maybe things start to happen in his life, like he loses his job or he loses a relationship or something like that. And then he has this moment of clarity where he's thinking, this has really taken over my life. I, I should quit. <laughs> but he doesn't. And before long, it has total control over him. He's so consumed in this example that he doesn't know how to stop because it's eating him alive from the inside out. And now he's sorry and he can't escape. So that's the kind of bondage, captivity that we're talking here. And how many times has that kind of thing played out over the years for people? Hundreds, thousands, millions, maybe? God told Moses in Deuteronomy 28 that if the Hebrews 
would follow the Lord, they would prosper. But if they didn't, they'd eventually end up serving their enemies. And that's come true here. That's what we're reading about. It was predictive. Well, look next with me as we kind of wind up this chapter. Look at verse 17. It says, Then the king of Babylon made Mataniah, Jehoiachin's uncle, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah will be the king through the Babylonian captivity. Go down to verse 20, that last verse there. He says, For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, that he finally cast them out from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Okay, just again, as a reminder, because we've covered all of this again and again, but just a quick reminder in case you're just jumping in here with us. There were all kinds of horrible acts of immorality going on there. They had adopted those things from the nations around them. And God saw it as awful and kept warning them. But in spite of the warnings, they turned their back on God and would not repent. And you know what it began with? It began with idol worship, false gods. They forgot that there was only one true God. So then that was kind of their weakness. I mean, the archaeologists have found hundreds of these little statues, these little idols that they had in their homes around Jerusalem because they had like turned their attention to those things. That was their weakness. Now, our culture, we have our own weaknesses, don't we? I remember a while back I was praying, asking God to show me what a real weakness of the people in this valley are. I just kind of want to like experience the pain or the thing that the people struggle with here so that I can be a minister to that. And I sense that the Lord showed me that the biggest thing that people struggle with in this valley is materialism. You know, because most people here have it pretty good. And when you have it pretty good, you can kind of get distracted by the stuff. I was just... My wife and I have had the same appliances in our kitchen for like 20 years. So we went shopping for new appliances. I wouldn't recommend this, (laughs) but we were doing it. And like, first of all, it's sticker shock. Like you can't believe. And then, you know, we start to like go, maybe we should just keep what we got. (laughs) It's like everything is so cool and and everything. And they kind of suck you into like you want all the stuff. So you have to be really careful and guard your heart about when it comes to materialism. Just want more and more and all the best and that kind of a thing. And then it just can distract you because then the stuff starts to own you. It might not be that. There's lots of different works of the flesh that people struggle with around here, whether it's sexual immorality or, or pride. But the Bible teaches that if we pursue any of these things, that we will become slaves of them. That that thing will actually rule over our life. I'm here to remind you that God wants you and I to be free from the bondage to the flesh. And the only way to get there is to put our old nature to death. That we would not tolerate it. And that's why I love reading about this. Even though these chapters are kind of painful sometimes to watch what they went through and then just like pokes at me about my own life. But it's good because I have to know that there's a real spiritual battle here going on. And we're not just messing around. We're not just playing games. That there's real temptation for the believers to get us off track. And our only liberty is in the Spirit of God. Anything else really can make me its slave. It could be possessions. It could be pleasure. It could be career. It could be adventure. Anything that I am devoted to more than Jesus is a problem. Now, if somebody insists on being captive to the enemy, God will let them, just as he let Israel do it. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because once you ally yourself with lesser gods, eventually you're going to be brought under its power and captive to it. There's this old Arab proverb that goes, once a camel has his nose in the tent, it will be impossible to keep the rest of him out. And that's a real good visual, isn't it? Just that pressing in and in and in. Uh, Paul the Apostle said it in a different way, I think in a better way. 1 Corinthians six twelve. he said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. 
Interesting, isn't that? You see, Christians, we have a lot of liberty. You guys know it. I know it. And so some things that we have liberty in can be destructive to us. Am I right? And so that's what that is. That's their, if this wasn't a potential problem, he wouldn't have said it. The good news is every single one of you who has Christ has the power of the Holy Spirit to resist destructive behaviors. And so you don't have to be afraid. You can resist them, including those that seem harmless on the surface, but take you further away from Jesus. You know, whenever somebody comes up and asks me a question about whether they should do something or not, one of my first thoughts is, well, is that going to take you farther away from Jesus or closer to him? That should help us make decisions in our life. The good news for you and I, my friend, is no matter who you are, you don't have to be brought under the power of of anything except the Lord. In summary, there, chapter 24, is if you don't become a slave of the world, you won't be sorry later. That's good news. Okay, so chapter 25 is continuing on, obviously. And this one is, don't become a slave of man. If you do, there's still hope. So chapter 25, number two here, if you do, there's still hope. And here is what it says. Now, it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled at night by way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans were still encamped all around against the city. And the king went by way of the plain. So all those men who were supposed to defend the city (laughs) make a run for it. It's like every man for himself. They're busting through. In that day, most cities would be built with walls around them. You can find those in the archaeological digs in Israel today, because that's how they defended themselves. Typically, there was one way in, and they would have a gate that would be guarded there. And so because of that, what the enemies would do, would first they would try and starve them out, cut off their water supply, don't let any supplies in and out, those kind of things. And then when they were getting weak, they would build a dirt ramp, these siege walls, so that they could easily break through what was going on there in the city. So that's what's happening here. The Babylonians are after Jerusalem. I like to make these spiritual connections with these things that took place historically because this is a way that the devil takes people captive too. You see, my friend, he studies you. He looks for ways to infiltrate your life. And so like I said before, this is not a game here. This is serious what's going on today. Because the devil is really good at patiently waiting and just slowly breaking down the resistance that we have. He knows what your weaknesses are. And if we're not careful, we will become his slave, just like Paul warned us to not become. And so I like to read these things again to remind me of a spiritual battle that's going on here and to be wise about how I live my life. If I could just say one thing to you today to take with you, it's be wise about how you live your life, Christian, because the enemy wants to ruin your life. He can't take your soul because God owns that. He won't lose you, but the enemy can mess up your life, and God doesn't want you to. They did, and look what's happened. Verse 5 says, But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and they overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah and they pronounced judgment on him. Then they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters and took him to Babylon. Isn't that awful? They made him watch his sons being killed and then they poked his eyes out. That was a common practice then to disable a person one way or another. You know, there was other ways they disabled them, but this was one way. And then 
keep them alive, they could suffer all their days, right? And then they wouldn't be a problem anymore. Uh, you remember this is what they did to Samson in the book of Judges, where the Philistines finally captured Samson, and they wanted to make sure they could control him, and so they put his eyes out, but you know the Lord still strengthened him, and he killed all the Philistines anyway. But that's what's happening here. They blind this king of Israel and take him to Babylon. The next little section here, verses 8 through 10, I'll just summarize it for you. It's, they destroy the temple and the city walls and all the property there. It's interesting, but some people think that later on, when Nebuchadnezzar makes a tower of himself in Daniel's day, you remember in the book of Daniel, he made a tower in Babylon for everybody to worship that tower was built out of the materials that he ransacked from Jerusalem. And uh, we don't know that for sure, but it wouldn't surprise me a bit if that's what he did. Because remember, Satan tries to imitate God because he wants to be God and he wants to be worshipped as God. And so he will do anything he can to get your allegiance And so it's good, again, to be alerted of these things because this is a spiritual battle that we're in. Well, I'd like you to move, if you would, with me to verse 11. And it says, Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city and the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitude. But the captain of the guard left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. What this means is the Babylonians now had full control and they've got the poorest people there serving them. Again, there's symbols of what happens in the spiritual realm. Imagine the enemy closing in on someone who's let him in the, like the camel with the nose in the tent. It's just getting more and more and more until full control and getting that poor person to serve him now. What a shame when that happens. Well, again, I'm not going to read all of this chapter, but suffice to say that they ransacked everything of value in the temple in Jerusalem and then burned it down. Those of you guys who know your Old Testament, this is what Ezra comes back to in Israel when he's called to go back by the Lord to rebuild there. Well, he comes back to everything totally crumbled down, everything broken, everything burned. Seventy years later, after the captivity, the whole city is in ruin. So just like it is now, what they're doing, it stays that way for those decades, and then they return to rebuild again. Okay, one more fast forward here. Verse 22 says, Then he made Gedaliah the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, governor over the people who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left. Now when all the captains of the armies, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah governor, they came to Gedaliah at Mizpah. Okay, now he mentions a bunch of names here that I'm not even going to try to pronounce, so you can give those a shot if you want. But it says, going on, Gedaliah took an oath before them and their men and said to them, this is key here, let's pay attention please. He said, do not be afraid of the servants of the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon and it shall be well with you. But it happened in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama of the royal family, came with ten men and struck and killed Gedaliah. The Jews as well as the Chaldeans who were with him at Mizpah. And all the people, small and great, and the captains of the armies arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. You see what happened here? So this guy, Gedaliah, he's a good guy, friend of Jeremiah, the prophet. There's a book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Gedaliah tells these guys to go peacefully to Babylon and serve the king and not be afraid. That's an interesting thing to say. His friend Jeremiah told him the same thing. And he said that God told him to say that to the Jewish people. These people that are going into captivity to the Babylonians. 
Now, that seems kind of strange to us, doesn't it? After all that's happened, now the Lord, through these guys, are saying, go there, be peaceful, serve the king, don't be afraid. It's the right thing to do. Why would he do that? Well, it seems like it's because the best thing that they could do now was to accept what's happening as the hand of God. This isn't the first time, or the last time, I should say, that this sort of topic come up. I mean, Paul writes about the very same thing in the book of Romans, chapter 13. The Christians were under Roman occupation, and he tells them to be in subject to the Roman government in Romans 13. Difficult for us to reconcile those things, because... That's instructive for us to do. And we're living in a day when we're trying to figure out, well, how do I obey the government, it says in Romans 13, but not violate God's word while I'm doing that? And there's a big question mark about that. I mean, all you have to do is go online or read the articles about arguments from both sides. And uh, um, it's been ongoing. And each Christian has to seek the Lord about that. Like, am I being problematic with being peaceful and a Christian, have a witness to the world around me, but at the same time not violating my conscience before the Lord. And I am trying to reconcile that myself and urge that that's what you guys are doing as well. Because here's something to think about. God wants them to go peacefully to Babylon, serve the king, not be afraid, because eventually, you know what's going to happen? He's going to turn this around in their favor. So like I said, leading into this chapter, there's still hope. There's a glimmer of hope. And we're going to see it here in a few moments. Just like he's going to turn things around in our favor too. One day soon, Jesus is going to return. And everything is going to be turned around in our favor. How did they respond? Did they do what Gedaliah said? No. They assassinate him. They didn't want to hear that. They wouldn't accept, what, you're telling us to go be slaves in Babylon and to go peacefully there and to be a witness there? No. So they kill him and then they flee to Egypt. So they didn't do what they were supposed to, according to God. They should have thought about all this stuff before they rebelled against God in the first place. So now in this situation, they live in a world. And one last thing I want to say about this and then I'll move on. Romans 13 tells us that God puts people in charge of the world. And a lot of it is for our own good. Some of it is not, just like we see here. Some of what they're doing is peacekeeping, and then some is unrighteousness. And that, of course, is going on with the United States government and every other government in the world. And so I'm not promoting one, but I'm also not saying that we're supposed to be rebels here either. God wants to work in each of our hearts in this matter. So this is a little side note since we're in this age of whether or not to take the vaccine, whether or not to mask up, how much do we do what the government says if they tell me that I can't go to work or can't go to church and, you know, all those kind of things. So anyway, guys, I know these are trying times, but Maranatha, Jesus is coming soon and it won't be long. Well, let's finish. Verse 27 it says, Now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, released Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin changed from his prison garments, and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king, a portion for each day, all the days of his life. This guy has been a captive for decades, but this new king shows him kindness. Remember, God promised them that he would restore them after a time of chastening. And that's exactly what's happening. And so what you're seeing here, even though it's a glimmer, it's a glimmer of grace, right? He has some hope here because there's going to be a gradual rebuild of these destroyed lives, just like he does with somebody who's 
been far away from God. You know, I destroyed my life in my 20s. And I thought there was no way out. And then God came into my life. And just over time, he began to restore it into something that's really useful to him. And I have a joy and peace with him now. And they have a similar thing in front of them. This king is just a picture of this glimmer of hope, despite what they've done. And so it is hopeful to read this, but it's not exactly a happy ending, is it? And again, I want to remind you, as we've gone through this together, that the Apostle Paul said these things are here for our admonition, our instruction. Let me show you one more thing he said there in 1 Corinthians 10, 6. He said, now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. You see that there? And in context, 1 Corinthians 10, it's talking about lusting after things like idol worship and complaining and tempting the Lord and sexual immorality, all those kind of things that people do. And basically what the summary is, if you don't lust for them, you won't be a slave to them. And this stuff, that applies to a lot of things. You could say that the whole purpose of this book, Second Kings, was to show how God was removing idol worship from the hearts of his people. Now, you want some good news? This has been kind of a difficult <laughs> section to go through. I want to give you some good news. Jeremiah, remember that letter I was telling you that he wrote to the people? He said, I want you to go to Babylon peacefully. I want you to go and be a blessing there. I want you to pray for them. I want you to build your families there. I want you to plant gardens there. And then he said this famous verse that most of us know from Jeremiah 29, 11. And let's look at this. He said, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. You see, in context, that was to encourage the Jewish people who were about to go into the Babylonian captivity but they were being urged to just, just be a blessing to them. Pray for them. Be a good citizen. And that's a word to us today, too. And so, as we see this here, it's, it's not over. God loves them. He's going to have them return once they repent and, and go through the trial that they, they got to go through because of their rebellion. But they do have a future and a hope. And of course, so do we. Maybe you've messed up big time in your life. Maybe there's something that's going on right now. I want you to know that there's hope for you. When I was driving in this morning before church, I heard this worship song that we've sang many times. It says, if oceans may rise up over my head, it doesn't change what he said. And that's such a word. It doesn't matter how deep the ocean's up over my head or how far the destruction has gone, there's still some potential hope. And I would just urge you, if you're far from God, that you would turn back. <laughs> it doesn't change what he said, no matter what we've done. Wanted to just do a, a quick uh, review. What did you guys learn from Second King? It's a lot of stuff here in these chapters. Some things that I learned were that is God is holy, God is patient, God is merciful, God is kind, and God is just. God provides all the necessary motivation and help that we need. And he also gives people a lot of time to change direction. But he holds people accountable for their actions and their decisions. Whether it's people who don't know him or for those of us who do. And God always has the last word. <laughs> he desires that unbelievers would turn to him and be forgiven for their sins. And he desires that the Christians would follow after Jesus so that they wouldn't go back into the bondage of sin. Amen? I want to give you a question for the car ride home. And the question is this. Are there any areas of your life that you are captive to? It's a good time to evaluate our life. God wants to do that and just shine a light on that. And if there's anything that's got a hold of you or potentially does, he wants to deal with that. And so I just pray that he would. 
and that you would go out of here in hope and trust in the Lord even more than when you got here. So God bless you this week. I pray that his grace would be upon you and bless you and encourage you and you enjoy your Labor Day celebration with your family and taking the day off and and that you would just experience God in a new, uh, deeper and profound way than you have before. So God bless you.